Hello again from me, Pam Rhodes, with another edition of Sunday Night Live, your weekly hour of news from around the Christian world, some to warm your heart, some to challenge your conscience and plenty to lift your spirit. Let's see what's in store today. A pastor from the state speaks movingly about the impact of COVID-19 on their community. Young Methodists trumpet their enthusiasm for the fellowship of making music together and the nuns who took to the streets to sing their praise and thanks. But first we head to Canterbury Cathedral, where the Dean, Dr Robert Willis, has been preaching the word from the gardens there, only to be upstaged by a couple of cheeky locals. Here's a member of the Premier News team to tell us more. Hi, I'm Cara Bentley and I'm one of the newsreaders at Premier Christian Radio. Now you may have seen recently quite a few videos of people being interrupted on live TV, maybe asking for biscuits, and maybe you yourself have been interrupted by verbal or non-verbal members of your own household. Well, the poor, very reverend Dr Robert Willis, who is the Dean of Canterbury Cathedral, has been interrupted several times in the last few weeks by his apathetic cats. The poor man was interrupted this week uh, while he was giving his morning message talking about the kingdom of God when one of his indifferent cats jumped onto the table and started dipping his paws into his milk which was meant for his tea and he didn't really stop going either. The cat quite frankly was not that interested in whether the kingdom was to come or had already come but it's not the first time Robert has had his theological thoughts so rudely distracted from. A few weeks ago uh, another one of his cats crawled under his robe, you might have remembered that, under his little kind of clerical black robe and a few weeks before that, uh, just a cat did a classic cat thing of interrupting you while you're trying to talk about Augustine. He was just sat on the chair next to him, just cleaning itself. So I think it's safe to say the uh, very Reverend Dr Robert Willis, the Dean of Canterbury Cathedral, is probably looking forward to a more engaged congregation returning who, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. There's a story of unfailing love that echoes in my heart. There's a promise that you're always here. Your word will light my path. We shall not fear the days to come. You are with us to the
Philip Hanna there reminding us that everything is possible, which is something I think we've all come to realise. Now we find ourselves living in a landscape across the world that is so different from what we always knew. Every country is facing the COVID-19 challenge in their own time, which means that as some are beginning to ease out of lockdown, others are still very much in the grip of the pandemic. So we hear now a moving insight into what life is like in Massachusetts from one of the pastors of the huge Grace Chapel in the town of Lexington. How do I describe pandemic life in the United States? Probably very much like life in most other countries. For a long time, our country was in lockdown. It was very unusual for me on the few times that I was out driving on major highways to see not one other car at all during my drive. Every aspect of our lives have changed, and we cannot yet fathom what the new normal will be. Over time, states started to open up a bit, and unfortunately, some of those states who opened early are now seeing a spike in the number of cases. So, I think I would describe life here in the United States in three words, fear, uncertainty, and sadness. Let's go to the one who understands our concerns and invites us to bring those concerns to him. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly and in awe of you. We come to you, Lord, in the midst of a very fearful and uncertain time. And yet, Lord, I'm reminded of Jehoshaphat who prayed as a vast army approached. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We pray that prayer today, trusting that you do have all things under control that there is no chaos in heaven over this, and that your perfect love casts out all fear. We cling to your promises that you will never leave us or forsake us. Father, I pray that in these days your children will seek a deeper walk with you, and those who don't know you will seek you, and they'll be found by you when they seek you with all their heart. Continue to guide and comfort us and bring us out of this season with a deeper and a renewed love for you. Our eyes are truly on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that is a prayer most certainly shared by Christians across this country. And we have seen so many examples of really imaginative ways in which they are taking the love of Christ out into their communities. But in Sunderland, the nuns of St Anthony's Convent of Mercy have taken more than that. They've taken their guitar and they've taken to the streets to sing out their thanks and praise. You know, it just makes you smile to watch that, doesn't it? A group of Christian women like those in ministry everywhere at the moment, wanting to reassure their community that they are loved and prayed for. And, you know, especially in our large cities across the country at the moment, many church leaders have heavy hearts as they recognise the challenges and the issues that are hurting those they serve right now. 
Here's senior pastor Calvin Young from Mount Zion in Birmingham. I've been feeling a, a real burden for the church to come together and to be united right across the board, white and black and Asian churches coming together. I believe this unity um, is damaging the church, and I believe God wants us to be one in fulfillment of the Lord's prayer, that they may be one as we are one. So I'm going to pray over that. Let us pray together. Father God, I thank you today for every person that is listening to this program and that is with us right now. Father, I pray for every person that they will just sense and know the love and the presence of God with them, wherever they are. And I pray in particular for your church and for answer to your own prayer that your church may be one. I pray for unity. I pray for harmony. I pray that there will be a coming together of your church leaders and members and attendees of your church. I pray you'll break the spirit of racism within our church. And I pray that you'll bring unity and harmony to your body so that we have one voice within our church and within our community. Father, be with us. Be with every person, whether they've been suffering from, Lord, this COVID-19 disease. We pray for your healing. And we pray, my God, for your peace to fill their hearts. Deliver every person from fear of this virus. We pray that faith will arise in every heart and the love of God will be poured out in every heart. Father, I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven.
light. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth over our city as it is in heaven. Amen. As we cry out to you over this city, we pray that change will come to all those who call on you. We ask in your name, in your name. One thing that's become clear in recent months is that even though our churches are not open to us, nothing can stop Christians enjoying the fellowship of music, sometimes just lending our virtual voices, sometimes grabbing an instrument to trumpet out our praise of God. The National Methodist Youth Brass Band is a group of young Christian brass and percussion players who meet together to make music, serve churches across the UK and abroad and grow together. The band was founded in 1987 when 20 young brass players from across the UK came together for a weekend in Surbiton. And from here on the band has met about four or five times a year at different Methodist churches all across the UK to have weekends. Our weekends consist of rehearsals, free time, a concert and a Sunday service amongst a lot of, a lot of fun and fellowship together. The band also go on tour once a year so we alternate between a UK and an abroad tour, and recently we have visited Scotland, Italy, the Isle of Man and Moldova. In February this year we met for a weekend in Scarborough, not knowing that it would be the last one in a while. And since the UK lockdown began we've had to postpone two of our weekends and our summer tour, uh, which is really sad because we all look forward to meeting together and playing together. But thanks to Zoom we've still been able to meet together. Um, and we've done this every day in an optional Zoom call so that people can come and just like see a friendly face and have a chat. Um, and also we've had a quiz every single Saturday brought to us by our conductor Simon. Um, and I think I speak for the majority when I say that this is definitely a highlight of a week. We've also been holding virtual prayer and praise gatherings. So one of our chaplains, Nathan, has been running these and the great mid bake off every fortnight. All that we've been doing over these months has really emphasised our motto. So our motto is FFF, which for any musicians out there, you will know that that means very, very loud, which is something we can do quite well. Um, but it also means fun, faith and fellowship. These are three things that we really value and, and love to share together. So a couple of weekends ago, we chose to host a virtual band weekend. The idea kind of arose as we were not able to hold our weekend at Litchfield Methodist Church as planned. Um, so our conductor Simon organised for us to put together a short concert of about 25 minutes and this consisted of five different pieces of music. Each member recorded their own bit um, and our conductor put it all together. So our theme for the weekend was choose to worship and we kind of looked at what it meant for us to worship in spirit and truth, especially at the moment when actually worship feels like it has to be more of a choice as we can't gather together as we usually would in band or in our own churches. Um, on Friday night we sang the song The Heart of Worship by Matt Redman together and it just reminded us that when everything else is stripped away um, our God is still the same and he longs for us to come together. Um, and he longs for us to bring him praise because of what he has done, not because of our circumstances. When the music fades 
all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship Cause it's all about you It's all about you I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus All about you to come on Sunday Night Live. We walk in the footsteps of the saints in Yorkshire, meet the children who are clearing up their toys and learning about the parables, and the Bishop of Durham reminds us that children should always be at the heart of our thoughts and our prayers. Many of us, certainly me included, have had to go through a very steep learning curve recently in order to find ways to work at home. But that's been even more of a challenge for those working for organisations that are supporting some of the most desperate communities around the world. Well, that's the dilemma that's been faced by Christine Allen, the director of the Catholic international development charity, CAFOD. 
Well, it's like everybody, you know, different because we're at home. Um, I'm very lucky because I've got I've got a little house and I've got a little garden, so um, I'm able to get out, have some fresh air. I do some exercises online, uh, which has been very exciting. Um, but my, you know, my husband's working at home. My, I'm working at home. My daughter, who's 14, is uh, you know in the bedroom, uh, attached to a screen. And I think although we are at home more, we're not necessarily always spending more time together. And what what I've felt over the last uh, couple of months in work is that it's been like an emergency situation, twenty you know twenty four seven. And in fact, I had a senior team meeting this morning, and our head of emergency said, you know, actually we're all pretty shattered. You know, right across the organisation, people are finding it really hard to to turn off, to you know, to relax. It's it's really difficult, and yeah, so many different things that we're dealing with. It is it is hard, but you know, we are lucky because we we've still got jobs and also because we're trying to help make the world a better place so it it gives us inspiration too and I think many people can relate to what you shared there about sort of feeling a bit exhausted but trying to do things differently and of course you know for CAFORD you are trying to make a difference in the lives of so many other people and I guess that keeps you going but have most people sort of ended up having to work from home how have things changed for you as an organisation? Well, a huge amount of stuff has moved online and, and I have to pay tribute to the CAFOD staff to uh, being able to do that. We've got, you know, children's liturgies on the Sunday morning, which is all done online. We've got this new thing of uh, assemblies uh, going out to schools uh, online. Um, you know, we've got the Summer of Hope where we're asking people people if you you were going what what were you going to do what are you going to miss out of well instead of feeling sorry for yourself feel hopeful and do something different i found out this morning that the hexam and newcastle diocesan pilgrimage uh, is is being done virtually cafford are joining in with that so loads of stuff that's happening online and our social media people have been terribly excited about that mm-hmm. um, in terms of but you know the reality of our work for our partners is that that's that's not online so you know hearing about the support that we've been giving to a a community or to a health center in Sierra Leone just this morning at our online staff briefing you know but seeing them with in their PPE you know with all of their sanitizers you know we're we're helping people to be to be still face to face to to people in need around the world and that's so important. And have there been perhaps areas of your work as CAFORD that has been challenging because of the pandemic and perhaps you can't operate in the same way. You mentioned, of course, there's Sierra Leone. You are based in countries all over the world. But I presume this pandemic might be uh, posing a few challenges to try and help and support people. The real issue for so many people that we're supporting is it's not so much the the health crisis of the virus, which obviously is a very big issue, but it's also the massive economic impacts of the lockdown so you know in countries where there isn't the same level of social protection that we have here and we've had the furloughing scheme and all sorts of other brilliant things that actually this government has done in in many of the countries if you don't go out to work or if you don't go to you know sell your produce on the street you simply can't feed your family and we know that here in this country we've seen a massive increase in food banks so we know that that kind of food insecurity is a big issue but actually what we're talking about is a crisis that's almost starvation for a huge number of people around the world and that's what many of our partners have been actively involved in.
we're all being encouraged to get out and about again, many people will be donning their walking boots and heading for the wide yonder. But as you're hiking over hill and dale, have you ever wondered who might have walked those same pathways before you? Well, Dr Gavin Wakefield in Yorkshire has been finding out. How much do we know about the Christian story of the places we live in? I'm fortunate to live in the city of York, where Christian history is seen all around in beautiful buildings like York Minster. And I've lived in various parts of Yorkshire and loved getting to know the people and places better. For over 40 years, I've travelled throughout God's own county, from Sheffield to Whitby, from Hull to Bradford, and countless spots in between. I've discovered places with deep Christian history, where many people, some famous and others now forgotten, have tried to follow God in their own ways. And that's been inspiring and sometimes challenging. Along the way, I've collected stories about the people who've helped to make these places special, even holy to us today. I've put them together in a little book which takes you on a pilgrimage in your imagination from your own home if you want, though it does also have tips on getting about as we come out of lockdown. Here's a mention of four people out of nearly 30 I've written about. In the gorgeous port of Whitby we learn about Hilda, a princess and nun from the 7th century who set up a monastery here so that people could learn to pray and to follow Christ. In her monastery, she trained women as nuns and men who went on to be priests and some became bishops. But she also found time to encourage an animal keeper called Cademan to develop a gift of hymn writing. And my personal link is strengthened by having a grandmother named Hilda. Over a thousand years later, William Wilberforce was brought up down the coast in Hull. He too wanted to follow Jesus Christ. In his case, he joined in the campaign to abolish the slave trade, and he played a key role in finally getting Parliament to agree to end this awful trade in human lives. His house in Hull is now a museum to his life, and also to the wider subject of slavery, its history and its modern forms. It's a thought-provoking reminder of what has been achieved and what remains to be done. At the far end of the M62 in Yorkshire is the industrial city of Bradford. Here I discovered a plumber who became an international preacher and healer, Smith Wigglesworth. Smith and his wife Polly came from very ordinary backgrounds, but loved sharing their faith. That might be chatting to someone on a bench in the local park, or preaching in a rented hall. They had a knack of speaking simply but profoundly about faith, and many people joined the church they formed. Smith also found he had a gift of praying for healings, and many people testified to being helped in this way. After the early death of Polly, Smith continued to preach and pray, and had a ministry in many countries, but always returned to their terraced home in Victor Road, Bradford. I end my journey in the book where I began my time in Yorkshire, in the still city of Sheffield. Sheffield Cathedral is where I was ordained for ministry in the Church of England in the 1980s, so it makes a particularly special end to the pilgrimage for me. I link the place with the story of Ted Wickham, a minister who wanted to connect the church with the working people of the city. I never met him myself, but I came across many who had and spoke of his inspirational work. Finding out more of the Christian story of Yorkshire has deepened my faith. I wonder what stories you know about your place and how they might strengthen your faith. Who were the local Christians from the past who inspire you? Can you find ways to share their stories to encourage us in our following of Jesus today? Any parent knows how difficult it can be to keep children happily occupied at home. But while the churches have been closed, 12-year-old Rose Hayward, who is part of the Sunday school team at Bunbury Church in Cheshire, has come up with some wonderful ways to keep the youngest members of their Sunday school interested in learning the stories of the Bible. Here's Rose to tell you about it herself. 
Since lockdown, I've started Kids Bunbury Church online so that the children don't feel alone and to remind them that God is with them. This clip was filmed before lockdown and now they get to see themselves on TV. A great way for children to learn about parables is to act them out. In this short video, we are acting out an everyday version of the parable of the workers. Whether the children tidy up brilliantly with great enthusiasm or just do a tiny bit of work right at the very end, they are given exactly the same reward, the same amount of love. Love isn't earned. Nothing we do makes God love us any more or any less. He loves us all exactly the same because we are all God's children. The kingdom of God is like this, a daddy who asks his children to tidy up for one sweet each. Some of his kids tidied with great enthusiasm. Some were enjoying playing just a little too much. Others tidied very slowly. And some only did a tiny bit right at the very end. It's not fair. I've done lots of tidying and I only got one more one. And Master's been tidying really slowly. And Freddy only did one thing at the end. I am being fair. You agree to work for one more one each. I want to give the others the same. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my sweets? Well, I think that certainly shows that given the right encouragement, young children are most definitely keen to learn about the Christian faith. And that is echoed in the reflection we're about to hear now from the Bishop of Durham, Paul Butler. Here's some words from Matthew's Gospel. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. I've been reflecting uh, over recent days on uh, where we've placed children in our thinking as a nation and as a church throughout the whole of the pandemic and in this whole business of recovering and recovering well and building back better, to use the political phrase. Well, if we're going to build back better, well, one of the things might be that we put the child in the midst of us to help us in our thinking about how we do church better. If the child is at the heart of our thinking, if as we begin to worship again in public, in buildings, alongside continuing to do online stuff for those who can't make it to church or are still fearful of coming, what does it look like if we think first so how are the children being welcomed and accommodated? And how are the children being involved in our worship and in our learning as we begin to worship afresh? Or is all our thinking around how we get back for adults and then, oh, what about children? What about the young people? My sisters and brothers, Jesus put children 
in the midst. And so should we. Not simply for their own sake, but for the whole body of Christ's sake. Jesus brought this child into the midst to teach the adults stuff about what true greatness looked like, to understand better what the kingdom of heaven is like. The child mattered for the whole family and the whole body. So as church, let's put children in the midst of all our thinking that we might build back better. But let's do that too as an example to society. Children have not been at the heart of the forward planning at national government or at local government level. They need to be at the heart of our planning. Their well-being, their welfare has to be not simply about health. It has to be about their social well-being. It has to be about their relational well-being. It has to be about their spiritual well-being. So returning to school matters enormously, but so does the capacity to be able to mix and to play and so on. Now, there's all the difficult issues around how you do that in the context of a pandemic, but the, but the well-being of children should be at the heart of national policy. That should be the, the core priority for us as a nation. How are the little ones being cared for? Just as rightly, in the midst of the the health crisis, it was care of the most vulnerable elderly and frail, those with disabilities, those who are most likely to be impacted, should have been given absolute priority. Now we need to think about children and young people and ensuring their well-being, their welfare, because that's the heart of God. That's the example Jesus gave us. Children welcomed. He was furious with his disciples when they tried to stop bringing children to him. No, let the children come to me. For as such is the kingdom. Place the child in the midst and see what it does for our thinking about the reopening of our buildings, about how we will function in the future, about how we will be church better, about how we will serve the community well. Put children at the heart of it and let's Give them the priority that is the priority of God in our churches and in our society. We need to do this for the children's sake. But we need to do it for the well-being of the whole church's sake and the well-being of the whole nation's sake. For how a nation cares for its children is a real mark of how deeply compassionate and caring a nation is. So let's pray now for the children of our nation and for those who have tough decisions to make. Loving God, thank you for all the children of our land, for the young people. Thank you for their vibrancy and their life. We know that they've had a really tough time through the months of lockdown. We pray that you help us as a nation, help us as a church, to put the well-being of children at the heart as we look to build back into the future. Help us to welcome children as Jesus did. Help us to place the child in our midst so that we might discover more about you and about your kingdom and about how we serve the world in your name. We pray in the name of Jesus, the friend of children. Amen. And so now, may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May the blessing of God Almighty, all loving, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. 
Well, our thanks to the Bishop of Durham, Paul Butler, there for his reflection. And that brings us almost to the end of this week's Sunday Night Live. But if you have any thoughts or comments that you'd like to share with us, we would enjoy hearing from you. You can find the address to write to at the very end of the programme. But we're going to end today with a blessing that comes to us from the new Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. From me, Pam Rhodes. Take care of yourselves and each other, won't you? Until the next time. Bye bye. May the love of our good and generous God guide and protect you. May the hope of the gospel sustain you and bring you joy. When you are lost or lonely, when the road ahead seems hard, or when the darkness gathers, may the light and peace of Christ be yours. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you protect you through the storm. May he bring you home, rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home, rejoicing once again into our door. Once again